Uh, hi, my name is Madam uh, Papillary Thyroid Cancer Survivor from Seattle. And this is the session titled The Changing Landscape of Differentiated Thyroid Cancer Management. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Hagen. Dr. Hagen is an endocrinologist at the University of Colorado, Denver, in Aurora, Colorado. Dr. Hagen is professor of medicine and pathology, as well as head division, as well as head division endocrinology and metabolism and diabetes, and chair of endocrine neoplasm research. Dr. Hagen's clinical and research interests focus on thyroid cancer, including molecular therapeutic targets. Dr. Hagen is a past president of the American Thyroid Association and a FICA medical advisor. I'll give you Dr. Hagen. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully you're having a good day so far and some of you got to see the uh, ring of fire, the little eclipse thing, pretty cool. It's already happened, so don't go running out to see it now. Um, so anyway, yeah, what I was asked to talk about was differentiated thyroid cancer and a broad topic of sort of the changing landscape. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with a slide and end with a slide, and that's we can kind of discuss about a number of things, and I'm only going to focus on one of them. I'm going to focus on radioactive iodine because that's a big question in differentiated thyroid cancer. Who needs radioactive iodine? Who doesn't? Um, so what I wanted to talk about was something old, something that I was part of and, and was the 2015, which were actually published in 2016, um, uh, guidelines on thyroid nodules and differentiated thyroid cancer. There's going to be guidelines hopefully coming out in 2024 from the American Thyroid Association, separate guidelines on nodules and another separate one on differentiated thyroid cancer. Again, we're focusing here on differentiated thyroid cancer, but I just wanted to talk about what I think were the new things that I think many of you who come to these things learn about, you know, not all providers know this yet. And that's a big thing where you, you'll see a bit of a challenge. So one of the things is what's called ultrasonographic risk patterns, ultrasound risk patterns. And that actually is gonna be changing in the 2024 guidelines for the nodules. Um, it's it's gonna be more comprehensive, but this can tell us which nodules to biopsy and which nodules don't need a biopsy. Used to be all nodules over one centimeter got a biopsy. So you're gonna see more on that as the next guidelines come out. And we're there are up nodules in patients up to two centimeters or even more, depending upon this the risk pattern that we see with ultrasound that don't need to be biopsied. Again, it used to be we'd biopsy all that were over a centimeter. This was something different and new in the 2015 guidelines, and it'll be further uh, worked on in the 2024 guidelines. Um, and another thing that was different was you don't need to biopsy every nodule over one centimeter. That's kind of what I said, these risk patterns that we see. And again, these questions, because I'll we'll hold these kind of till the end, because I've put this back up. Don't have to biopsy any nodule less than a centimeter. Even if it is highly suspicious and we think it's cancer, if it's well within the thyroid and looks like it's behaving itself, we have discussions. And some patients, we just say, you know, we're just going to watch this, kind of like they watch small prostate cancers. Um, that's, a, that's a big, big change. A lobectomy, taking out half the thyroid, that's what people did years ago. And then when I was training 30 years ago, you took the whole thyroid out for every thyroid cancer. And now there's a lot of patients, we just take out half a thyroid. And there are challenges with that and some good things with that. And again, we can talk about those more at the end. More detailed pathology reports. They've gotten so much better to help us what's called risk stratify. Say, okay, are you low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk of this trying to come back? I'll talk mostly about the radioactive iodine, but in general, what these guidelines did, and I believe the next set of guidelines are gonna probably do about the same. I don't know if they're gonna get even more, like use less and less radio iodine. This was a big jump. And I'll talk a little bit as I do throughout, but we got into a lot of hot water with especially uh, nuclear medicine groups. They, they just disagreed with us. And I think they're still disagreeing with us on, on this. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging for higher risk disease before surgery. So that means like CAT scans and MRIs. Used to be, we'd say, don't do a CAT scan because that uses iodine and then we can't use radioactive iodine. We found we can. And so in patients were really concerned, might have like invasion or something deep in the neck that an ultrasound can't find. We're recommending more and more CAT scans. Um, obviously the staging system, and again, I'll talk a little bit about, about that, um, how the staging system has changed. Some other things have uh, come up there. Individualized thyroid hormone therapy on our, what we do, the target TSH, and we'll talk to patients a lot about, I think your TSH should be here for these reasons. And then finally, I think what's gonna be different in the differentiated thyroid cancer, because there's much more data, 
is how do we take care of patients who have radioiodine refractory disease that is progressing? How do we take care of them? And you're going to see a lot of changes, I think, there. All right. So I think this, this kind of summarizes to me the conundrum we kind of deal with a lot of times in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer, which primarily is papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. And this was a study um, uh, out of Julianne Sosa, Sosa's group and Kerry Kitahara's group that looked at what's called a SEER database, a really big database of cancer, and was looking at trends. Um, and again, I don't think my... Uh, so in the orange line you see on the top there is the increasing incidence of differentiated thyroid cancer, rapidly going up. Right below it in the blue line is regional disease, usually lymph node metastases going up. At the bottom, that kind of top hockey stick that goes down a little and then goes up, that's distant metastatic disease. Because we, a lot of people say, well, thyroid cancer is going up because we're just finding more because we're doing ultrasounds for other reasons, or you get a CAT scan or something like that. That's true, but it's not the whole story. Bigger thyroid cancer and metastatic thyroid cancer is going up as well. And if we look at it, the in incidence of, of all thyroid cancer uh, over this period of time has been increasing. I think it might be leveling off a bit now, which is good. I think we maybe all are ways of finding it, but it had been really going up. And you can see the mortality has also been going up a little bit, not as rapidly, because fortunately, most of this new detection stuff is treatable stuff, and people are surviving a long time. But the distant metastases are going up as well. And mortality from distant metastases are going up. So and when it comes to radioactive iodine, the conundrum we have in a way is don't, don't do one size fits all. Don't say to everybody, everybody gets 100 millicuries no matter what kind of thyroid cancer you had, okay? We got we to gotta tailor it. So one way we do that at the University of Colorado is we have a radioiodine uh, review conference between nuclear medicine and endocrinology. And so we meet, we're meet, we meet on Zoom now, and uh, the two people in the middle, the, the woman with the uh, grayer hair and, and glasses, that's Erin Meyerhoff, our, physician, our uh, nurse practitioner who coordinates this. And right below her, many people who've worked with us know Bev McLaughlin. She's our patient care coordinator. And then on the, on the left-hand side is our nuclear medicine specialists. And on the right-hand side is our endocrinologists who, who join in on this. And what we do is we talk about, should this patient get radioactive iodine? If so, how much? And we will review the literature and we do all sorts of stuff. So I think this is very helpful to bring nuclear medicine and endocrine together to, to make these decisions. So why do we use radioactive iodine? There's three big reasons. When I talk to my patients about it, I say, um, number one is for therapy. And the intention there is you have cancer, like metastatic cancer, and we're treating it. That's therapy. Then there's adjuvant therapy, which means I think the surgeon got it all out but it's a pretty high risk disease, big old lymph nodes, or it was trying to grow outside your thyroid, you're at a high risk for it coming back or recurring. Then what we do is we use it for adjuvant therapy to decrease that risk of coming back. And final one is remnant ablation. Because as many of you know, when the surgeons do surgery, they try to leave a little nub in a tissue right where your voice nerve inserts. Because if they tug at that, they can cause hoarseness. And of course, if they cut, they can cause you know, permanent hoarseness. And so sometimes what some people want to do is ablate that little bit of remnant um, to get rid of it, to make it easier to follow. I don't now these days follow that. I, I'm looking at it more for recurrence risk. And again, I'll go through why some of that stuff we do. Um, so what information do we need to make that decision in our patients with papillary and follicular thyroid cancer? We do it with Herthel as well, the, the oncocytic. But we need to know the stage and as I tell my patients, we do staging to ask the question, could this cancer shorten your life? And there are four stages, one through four. And the answer pretty much with, number, with stage one is pretty much no. And I'll show you, I'll get a little bit of data on that. And then, but stage isn't good to predict, is it going to come back? So that's why we use the American Thyroid Association recurrence risk, low, intermediate, and high. But the other thing we want to do is the thyroglobulin, that tumor marker, because it's a good tumor marker in papillary follicular and um, ox oncocytic cancer. Um, we'll talk about antibodies at the end. That's a whole nother issue, but it's very good. And the other thing is, is that this is post-operatively we get it because your thyroid's gone, so it should be low. One thing we're doing more and more now is getting it preoperatively on patients. And I just want to show from 
This is from our guidelines. I was the chair, first author of these guidelines. And I say sometimes I write guidelines. I don't necessarily read them. Um, and this is the third recommendation is routine measurement of serum thyroglobulin for initial evaluation of thyroid nodules is not recommended. Well, the main reason we said that is because a big old benign thyroid nodule can make a lot of thyroglobulin too. So it's not a good predictor of is yours a cancer or not. Where we now use it preoperatively is we say, your tumor is suspicious for cancer or looks like it's cancer, then we want to get it preoperatively. Because if it's really high, we know it's probably a good tumor marker. If it's really low, it's probably not going to be such a good tumor marker in that, in that patient. And we can check and see if you have antibodies. Because the antibodies, as many patients know who deal with this, interfere with that test. They don't hurt the patient. They just interfere with that test. So those are things we want to know. So stage. Um, and this, uh, again, I was involved in this changing. There's now an eighth edition of the uh, American Joint uh, Commission on Cancer um, called AJCC, and it's the TNM. Everybody knows T for the tumor characteristics, N for lymph nodes, and M for distant metastases. Um, but it changed a few years ago from stage seven to now stage eight, and there were some big changes. Used to be when I was doing this five, 30 years ago, Age 45 was the cutoff. I don't know one thing if you know, the only cancer that it, all cancers use this staging system. The only cancer that uses age directly in the staging system is differentiated thyroid cancer. So it was below 45, now it's below 55 because there's data that shows actually what it is is a continuum. But most people between age 45 and 55 acted like younger patients with a risk of recurrence and, and acting badly over age 55 and probably over age 60 is where it does behave more badly when you're diagnosed. Um, and so there we change that. And I'll show you how that affected uh, as far as the number of people who got these different stages. The other thing you'll see here is if you're less than age 55, highest stage you could be is two. Stage one is anything that doesn't have distant metastatic disease. Stage two is patients with distant metastatic disease. So if you have a big old tumor that's growing out the side of your neck into your muscles and all that stuff, if you're age under 55, that's stage one. What it means again is your survival is very good. And I'll show you that. Now, over age 55, 55 and older is the typical way other cancers stage things. You know, if it's confined to the thyroid, you're stage one and it's smaller. Actually, the size cutoff did go up though. If it's less than four centimeters, you're stage one. That used to be stage two in the old guidelines. Um, stage two is tumors over four centimeters, used to be stage three. And um, any lymph node involvement, and again, that used to be stage three or even stage four in some patients, um, or gross extrathyroidal extension. And what we mean by gross versus microscopic is gross means the surgeon can tell. When they go in there, they're like, oh, this is invading. This is invading. Microscopic means the surgeon says, I think I got it all, you know, but I took some tissue around it and the pathologist sees a little bit. Microscopic invasion is no longer in staging because it doesn't affect survival negatively affects survival. It does affect recurrence though. So it's in recurrence. So anyway, those are the things highlighted in red that you can sort of see there. And just to make things more confusing, stage four used to be A, B, and C, and now it's just A and B. So <clears throat> anyway, this is what we kind of work with. So this is, it's, it's cool looking. And I love the name of this. It's called an alluvial diagram. I just love that name. I don't know why. But anyway, what this is doing is comparing in a group of patients from MD Anderson, a large group of patients, it's uh, over 2,500 patients. When they had the stage seven, because you can do all the individual TNM and you can then change your stage. So these same patients on the left-hand side were in stage one through four, you see. One thing I will say is that um, don't the, the size of the boxes doesn't represent how many patients are in each on the left as the way they did it, it does, it's more representative on the right for stage eight. But if you look at stage one down at the bottom, 1600 of those patients, so a majority were stage one. Actually a small minority were stage two. The next most common in the old staging system was stage three because of those lymph node mets in people over age 45 at that time. And then there's quite a big group in stage four as well. So what this did when they reclassified, you can see a ton of patients went down into stage one. And the way the, the diagram does, you could look up at yellow stage four. There are some patients who were stage four and now they're stage one. Wow. And a lot of people stage three and almost all, most people stage two became stage one. Okay. And so then the question comes is, is it accurate? <laughs> it's kind of nice. You get to move most people into stage one and say, congratulations, you're stage one. And this is again, one example of many examples where 
upper left is uh, in the blue is disease specific survival, meaning if the person did not survive, did the cancer cause it? And down below that is overall survival, died from any cause. Okay. And then on the red on the right hand side is disease specific survival on top for the eighth edition and overall for the eighth edition. And what you can see is the upper left hand side. Look at stage one, two, and three. They're all together. They're not, that's not a very good predictor of who's going to, they're all surviving pretty well. And if you then move over to upper right, the red disease specific survival, that top line looks great. We moved a ton of people into stage one and their survival is still great. Stage two is pretty good, but it's a little less, a little worse than stage one, but that's why we do staging. Stage three is worse, stage four is worse. And you can see the same thing with overall survival. So it's now moved tons of people into stage one and also a better predictor for the question, what's the chance of this cancer shortening in your life? Okay. Oops, I got to remember how I do this. So, but it doesn't predict recurrence. And that's what we did in the American Thyroid Association guidelines was in this, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Mike Tuttle, who really had been doing a lot of this and we codified it in actually the 2006 guidelines and then even expanded it in the 2015 guidelines. And uh, Dr. Ringel, who's one of the co-chairs of the 2024 guidelines tells me they're gonna keep it probably pretty similar for 2024. So hopefully it won't be like something we'll all have to learn new, we'll see. Anyway, you have low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. And what we did was we didn't do cutoffs. It's a continuum. And this is all the different possibilities of putting you in those groups, kind of overwhelming. But you see, there isn't a break point. So somebody like me might have a higher threshold of saying, I think that's still low risk. Other people have put it in an intermediate risk or into high risk. Um, but what I, the reason I wanna use this also is lymph nodes. Used to be everybody who had lymph nodes was higher risk. You didn't have lymph nodes, you were lower risk, it lymph nodes, you're higher risk, or um, you'd be in the intermediate risk group. Now what we've done is broken it down. If, if at the bottom, you have lymph nodes, but they're not trying to grow outside the lymph nodes and they're not big and you don't have a lot of them involved, that's low risk. Lymph nodes that are low risk. On the other hand, if you go to the very top red one, so now what we have is we have lymph nodes that have, are very large or are growing outside the lymph node called extra nodal extension. Those things put you at higher risk for persistent or recurrent disease. So now instead of saying to everybody, oh, you're in the middle group, we say based on what the nodules, uh, what the lymph nodes are, it puts you into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Okay. And as again, I talked to Dr. Ringel, and at least he says that they're not going to grossly change these. So we're not going to all have to learn something new, at least here, maybe in another area. So what about radioactive iodide? Now that we know how to stage and risk stratify, and this is a nice historical, uh, Dr. Uh, Saul Hertz who actually was treating a hyperthyroid patient in January of 1941, some of the earliest use of radioactive iodine. And it was first used in hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, overactive thyroid. You zap it, no longer overactive, became underactive. But they also realized that people with thyroid cancer, especially lung metastases, they could give them a big dose of radioactive iodine and treat the lung metastases. And that started in the kind of mid-1940s. So that's, that's when we first started treating people. I didn't, I wasn't around then, but first started treating people for thyroid cancer. So when we look, who should we use radioactive iodine in? If you look at the guidelines, and again, I think the newer ones are gonna probably stick pretty close to this. There may be some differences because there was some data that's come out. But if you're low risk, meaning your tumor's less than one centimeter, most experts would say you don't need radioactive iodine. Because I always say, Am I using it to improve your survival? Just showed if, that you're stage one, your survival is great whether you get radioactive iodine or not. So I usually don't use it. Risk of recurrence, there's no evidence in this low risk group that recurrence is decreased because it's all, already super low that it's decreased. So we say don't use radioactive iodine. One to four centimeter tumors, this is where the new guidelines might change out a little bit and say you probably don't need it. We just said not routine back then, okay? Because remember a lot of people just get half a thyroid taken out if it's under four centimeters and you don't see anything else suspicious, okay? So that's where we say, duh, now we don't use it. And interestingly though, and I'd love to see some more surveys, but now these are physicians treating patients with thyroid cancer. And this was published though in 2013. So it's just a little bit before the guidelines came out. Um, and what it shows is this is patients with tumors less than one centimeter, right? I just said, don't use it. If, you, if you're in New England, at least according to this survey, 25% of patients are gonna get 
treated or 25% of providers are going to want to treat the patients. Here in the Mountain West, we're on the far end, other end. It's almost 50% said, yeah, I'd treat somebody with a teeny tiny tumor with radioactive iodine. So I think we still need to get that education out on why are you doing it? Radioactive iodine, I'll, I'll show near the end. Radioactive iodine is, I think is great in the right circumstances, but it also can harm some patients. It's not totally harmless, okay? So this is a recent study that asked the question, okay, we take your thyroid out, you have low risk cancer, we don't give you radioactive iodine. I give the French group a lot of credit. They've done a bunch of studies that, that are what are called randomized controlled trials. We didn't have those in our field for the longest time. And this is really a good one called Estimable 2 um, that asked that question. So it took patients, uh, 724 patients, divided them in half, half got radioactive iodine, 30 millicuries, low dose, and half got no radioactive iodine. And then they followed them for at least three years. And basically what this summarizes is the recurrence rate was about 4%. Makes sense, nice and low, low risk patient. 4% whether you got radioactive iodine or not. Other thing that was interesting was you got, if you got a dose of radioactive iodine and found a little something there, patients were more likely to get a second dose of radioactive iodine. So it did say you're gonna get more radioactive iodine. The other thing that I think was <clears throat> kind of fascinating with this um, is that 50 to 60% of patients, which is that's in the population in general with papillary thyroid cancer had BRAF mutations. Didn't matter. Radioactive iodine, if you just looked at the BRAF patients, whether you got radioactive iodine or not, didn't matter. Still had low risk of recurrence. Okay. So a small tumor with a BRAF mutation is not cause for panic. About half people with small tumors are going to have BRAF mutations. It doesn't, what it does is it predicts ahead of time what's the pathology going to be like. Are you going to more likely to have involved lymph nodes with BRAF? Yes. Are you going to be a higher risk of it trying to grow a little bit outside the thyroid? Yes. But it doesn't, beyond that, then when you look at the pathology, it doesn't predict how somebody's going to do. The pathology is a better predictor. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing was if you had a higher postoperative thyroglobulin, less or greater than one was their cutoff here, more likely to have recurrent or persistent disease. So then we can start thinking, ah, we'll add the thyroglobulin in there when we say, should I give you radioactive iodine or not? If you have a high thyroglobulin, I'd maybe be more likely to do it. Because if you had the thyroid totally removed, it's really just telling us about cancer at that point. But most patients who get their total thyroid out have low thyroglobulins afterwards. And that could be reassuring. Yes. Question on Zoom. Is there a movement to restage differentiated thyroid cancer patients after initial treatment? Or is there staging at initial diagnosis treatment the best predictor, even in the new staging groups that you just presented? Yeah, so that's a good question. And we, what we do is with staging and with that ATA risk, you only get those at the beginning. Because think about it, if you have somebody who's 40, 16 years later, they're, 40, they're 56. If you restage them, they're going to go up in stage because they're older. But the data only supports at time of diagnosis because everybody's going to get older. <laughs> so, you know, so that's a reason why we don't, one big reason in thyroid cancer, we don't restage because age is such an important factor. So we do not restage. We don't re-risk stratify. What we do is we say a third thing, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today is response to therapy. That can change every time you see a patient. So you sort of are restaging them in a way by saying, what is your response to therapy? Is it excellent? I can't find anything. Is your tumor marker high? Do I see disease on imaging? So you do redo that every time you see the patient. So in a way, we are restaging them that way. But technically, we don't recommend restaging. And then this just shows the two studies in 2012, one out of the UK, one out of France. Again, randomized controlled trials. It's great. Showing that low dose of radioactive iodine and low-risk disease, if you're going to use it, is just as good as high risk, as, as high dose. And what they compared was 30 millicuries and 100 millicuries. So that's why you when now when a lot of people come to us, if I say, yeah, I think I'd better give you a little radioactive iodine just to, you know, make sure it doesn't come back, but I'm not too worried. We're going to use that 30 to 50 range. I used to give everybody 100. And actually, if you had anything in the thyroid, 100, any lymph node, one teeny tiny lymph node, 150, lung metastases, 200. So we made it really simple. We just said, that's it. But we, now we've really backed off on the administered activity or the dose as well, based on these good randomized controlled trials. 
So high risk disease, yes. It's, it's good for survival, good for recurrence. It's a good targeted therapy. So we're not bashing radioiodine saying, quit using radioactive iodine. Just use it where it's gonna be best used. And that's for people who have that gross extrathyroidal extension. And usually if they'll have positive margins on the pathology, and then obviously people with distant metastatic disease where it does concentrate it. It's very useful in those people, okay? But what about that middle box? That's the intermediate risk group. So there's low risk, high risk, and intermediate. So we're saying in the low risk, you probably shouldn't use it. High risk, you definitely should use it. What about intermediate risk? This is where we struggle. And I'm not gonna have a perfect answer for you today. I'll give you my impression and my opinions, but you, this is where you'll see differences of opinion still. So intermediate risk, a big primary tumor or microscopic invasion. Intermediate risk can be, again, the more lymph nodes you have is kind of more concerning and that puts you into that intermediate risk category. So those are ones, and what we said in the guidelines is considerate because we didn't have enough evidence to say yes or no. So we copped out and we said, consider it, think about it. So that's what we do. So what's the data since then? And this was a big study again by Julianne Sosa's group um, looking uh, again at, uh, this was, I think, I can't remember if this is again, the SEER database, but one of the big databases, they do a lot of this database, a lot of this database work. And what they found, they teased out as best they could that this intermediate risk group and they said, does radioactive iodine help? This is overall survival. And the answer was yes. So intermediate risk, overall survival. Unfortunately, they didn't look at disease-specific survival. Did you die from the cancer? Or disease-free survival, did it come back? They didn't look at those, just overall survival. But it looked like the answer was yes. So maybe we should consider it in our patients with intermediate risk disease. They also did another paper where they focus more on the lymph nodes and ask the question if the ultrasound or whatever imaging you did didn't show big old bulky lymph nodes and the surgeon didn't say, oh, look at those nasty lymph nodes at surgery, but they took some out and the pathologist said, ah, I see some cancer in the lymph nodes, which how often is that? That's about 50% of the time. We'll see it. If you do a good neck dissection and take out the lymph nodes, even though the surgeon sees nothing and we see nothing on imaging, half the time you're going to find little bits of cancer. And again, this is papillary. Follicular is a bit different. From that. So this there's, there's, is where there's a difference. So what they found was, um, makes sense, the more nodes you look at, the more disease you find. You know, if you pull out two lymph nodes, you maybe see less. If you pull out 20 lymph nodes, you got a higher rate of seeing something. Because I just told you, it's pretty, pretty common. 78% increased risk, uh, increased use of radioactive iodine in patients who did have these little bits of cancer in their lymph nodes versus those who didn't. So drove a lot more given people radioactive iodine. How'd they do? <clears throat> so they say unsuspected central nodal metastases in clinically N0, meaning we can't find it with imaging or the surgeon doesn't see it. Patients are associated with increased utilization of radioiodine and no survival differences. So it didn't seem to make any difference. So here now we're starting to parse out, well, maybe those big old lymph nodes ought to be treated. Patients ought to be treated. And maybe the ones with just a few little lymph nodes don't need to be. That was a big departure from kind of, it's a big departure from what was there before. They always said, if you have lymph nodes, you treat. And I have patients now who have lymph nodes and I don't treat and we're following them, okay? This was a study we did, part of the National Thyroid Cancer Registry. Um, Steve Sherman out of MD Anderson led this for a number of years. This is just a big registry that we followed patients for a long time. Uh, their staging was a little different in, I should say our staging was intermediate risk was stage two in this case. So it's like, lymph node involved, microscopic extrathyroidal extension, those things. And what we found in the first publication, looking at 763 stage two patients following them for a number of years, was that, and this is, it's kind of weird, it's opposite, the relative risk that 1.71 you see next to stage two, it's kind of flipped. It means that radioactive iodine was better. So that's in overall survival, it was better. In disease specific survival, did the cancer do the, did the cancer shorten your life? It was better. And then uh, it was uh, not significantly better, or I'm sorry, it wasn't significantly better for disease specific or, or disease free survival, but overall survival, it was better. So maybe we should use it. Well, we repeated it with more patients, now 1,334, following them for a much longer period of time, and that went away. So now more patients, longer period of time, this intermediate group didn't seem to improve overall survival, disease specific or disease-free survival. So this would lean towards saying, no, we probably shouldn't 
use it in many of these patients. This is a study out of Korea, Samsung University. And they again, what they did was they pulled out this intermediate risk group. And the answer was, did it improve recurrence-free survival? So this is recurrence now. And the answer was no in this intermediate risk group. And the Mayo Clinic, they always have a bunch of studies. And they had up top were patients who did not have involved lymph nodes. And on the below were the patients who did. And then did, the question is, did you have a local recurrence, a regional recurrence, meaning lymph nodes, or distant metastatic disease? And what I want you to focus on is the ones who did have lymph nodes, because these are our intermediate risk group patients. Actually, the people who got radioiodine did worse. Now, it could be because now you have a more sensitive technique of, of finding little stuff. And so you might have done that. But it, didn't, it wasn't better using radioactive iodine. Um, and then this one's out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I'll tell you in a, in a minute why I like this one. Um, the problem with this one is they have their own wacky staging system that basically asks sur stay, uh, for survival. Um, they, and they looked at this cumulative survival. But the answer was you didn't have radioactive, um, radioactive iodine didn't help. But one thing neat that they did, the only patients that had intermediate risk disease who could get in here are ones that had a low postoperative thyroglobulin. So once again, if you have a low postoperative thyroglobulin, even if you have intermediate risk disease, you maybe don't need, need radioactive iodine. It's kind of a newer thing we're thinking about. Um, and then this just shows their overall disease specific and uh, relapse-free survival, recurrence-free survival. And, and really radioactive iodine didn't, didn't change that. So what we're having is we do have a few studies of these big, because this is like a single center database, so it's got its own faults. And then there are those big national database studies. A few things that say, yeah, we should consider it. And I'd say maybe a few more that are saying, now, nah, if you pick the right person, you maybe shouldn't, maybe shouldn't use it. Um, and so I thought what was interesting here, there's a, there was a European uh, consensus uh, uh, that uh, discussion, and they said, the first thing they said was nice. The American Thyroid Association management guidelines for patients with nodules and differentiated cancer are highly influential practice recommendations. That was nice. Thank you. Then they said significant divergence involved ATA's 200, 2015 guidelines regarding radioactive iodine. European panelists, many of these were nuclear medicine specialists, favored wider use of post-operative radioiodine than does ATA. So there's still this debate in the field. Even, even US nuclear medicine people are, are, use it more than I think the endocrinologists and surgeons uh, use it. And they say rationales for doing this more include modalities association with favorable patient outcomes. So I just showed you. I don't know if those are necessarily favorable in, in intermediate risk patients. Generally limited toxicity, and we'll come to that at the end, and I love this, and lack of high quality evidence supporting withholding it. This is like the first time when somebody says, well, we're gonna give something until, until you can show us it's not working. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like, wait a minute, you're supposed to do it the other way around. You're supposed to show that it works, and then you give it, right? And th there they're saying, until we have high quality data, let's give it until we have high quality data saying we can't. And obviously we do have high quality data now in low risk patients and saying, don't do it. And then this, I, I like this, a couple of colleagues, I like these guys, but they, it's just kind of funny. They want actually a, a title of one of the papers they did about our guidelines was, um, is it something about, is it science or dark arts that uh, we're doing? So I'm being claimed doing dark arts, at least until randomized prospective studies with long-term follow-up are available, performing I-131 therapy in patients with a differentiated thyroid cancer exceeding one centimeter remains an eminently sensible option. So still that same thing, unless you can prove it's not working, we're going to keep giving it. Um, so we just got to do studies to prove where it works and where it doesn't. And I, I think I've shown you a preponderance of data that in many patients on that lower end of the intermediate risk group and definitely the low risk group, we're not seeing a benefit. So hopefully they'll come around and look at that data and say, yeah, we agree with you. So I said toward the end, I'd come to the radioiodine adverse events, something called sialadenitis because the salivary glands concentrate radioactive iodine and people can have pain and swelling even years later in some cases. Because what happens is, is it does almost it damages the salivary glands. Luckily, most people, it's very mild and the salivary glands still have good function. But sometimes when the salivary glands aren't working so well, that duct will get sludge in it and sometimes even little stones and it'll block up and it'll swell and hurt. And that's pretty painful. There are ways we can do to treat it, but that's a side effect. And obviously the dry mouth can be a terrible side effect in a number of patients. And depending upon the study, 
um, like you see with there's ultrasound damage, 25% of patients who get 100 millicuries have ultrasound documented damage. They may not have symptoms, but ultrasound damage. 10 to 30% and it's dose dependent of patients um, have dry mouth. And then even out after, after three years, about 15% of patients have dry mouth. And that can be a problem. So we, we don't want to give it if we don't think we're doing benefit. We can't say, oh, there's no harm to it. And then there's this thing, Epiphora. I don't know if any of you have had that. I like, again, that's a word I like. What the heck is it? It means your tear ducts get blocked because the little lining cells of your tear ducts can take up a little radioactive iodine. Those cells sometimes will slough and they'll plug the tear duct. So it does, your tears don't run into your nose, they run out your eyes and you just have excessive tearing. That can be fixed. Some people need surgery, like in this study was 1% of people and only about three to 5% of people get it, but it can be very bothersome if they get it. Fertility issues, that's more concerning. There can be some fertility issues here. Mostly what we see is males with sperm count. If you check, sperm count will go down. Fortunately, these lower doses in women, as far as fertility and eggs, it does not seem to cause a big problem. There was one big study out of Italy that showed women who got radioactive iodine who had thyroid cancer versus women who had thyroid cancer and did not get radioactive iodine went into menopause on average one year earlier. So it does seem to affect it, but probably not to a big clinical realm. Now, obviously, a woman should not be pregnant when she gets radioactive iodine because that could hurt the baby. And then finally, the second cancers. It's radiation that can cause other cancers. Fortunately, the risk of that is very low, especially with these doses we're using, 30 to 100 millicuries. But there is a cumulative lifetime. If you keep getting multiple doses, you're increasing that risk. The cut point that we see in a lot of studies is about 600 millicuries. Fortunately, these days, we're not giving a lot of patients their lifetime dose of more than 600 millicuries. Again, absolute risk is low, but the relative risk is real and it's dose dependent. So that's another reason to say, well, should I give it? So it's not without side effects, but again, it's still a very good therapy. So how do we then put this together? And again, the French group, uh, Schlumberger, uh, Martin Schlumberger and uh, Sophie Levelou uh, put this nice thing together that I, I kind of really like. The one thing they do is mess us up a little bit is they do gigabecquerels. It's like how many millicuries in a gigabecquerel, right? Um, well, you can see on the far left side, there's where you give no radio iodine and below it, is kind of those patients, the low risk patient we talked about, kind of intermediate, uh, low end of intermediate is that split. Some get radioactive iodine, maybe some don't. And then you have more radioactive iodine kind of in the middle and far group. 1.1 gigabecquerels is 30 millicuries. 3.7 is 100 millicuries. So that's kind of what they're recommending. The French have always been big on just giving 100 millicuries. Um, they, that, they like that. But anyway, so in a lower risk patient, you say, no, you don't need it. I would disagree with them a little. I don't even think a lot of those people in that middle group, uh, the, the, the second to the right, 1.1 gigabecquerels or 30 millicuries, they probably don't need radioactive iodine. So one thing I've said in the past about some of their studies and stuff too is, if your patient doesn't need radioactive iodine, give them 30 millicuries. So, but I, I like to give zero. Was there a question? Got a question on Zoom. Yeah. Suppose zero stomai is alleviated with time. Does this mean that the enzymes and antibacterial material is also restored. Is there any way to know this? I'm pretty tired of nightly fluoride frames and xylomelts. Xylomelts, yeah. Boy, xylomelts, they're good, but they have their side effects. Um, so uh, yeah, when it resolves, what I would say is just based on that ultrasound data I talked about, um, if you look at the salivary glands, they are damaged. And what happens is when you say it's resolved, it means that you've, your, your salivary glands are maybe 70% of what they used to be, but they're still, clinically, they're still working. So probably you are still at a bit of increased risk for things like uh, gum recession, tooth loss, tooth decay, things like that. You're at a little bit higher risk if you've had, especially xerostomia, the dry mouth. Sialadenitis, it's a little more debated. Remember, that's just where it hurts. It could be that it kind of goes back to normal, but I think people are always at a little bit higher risk. Um, so what I do is we work with our dentists to say, what's the best plan for you? Uh, does REI cause dry eyes? Um, yeah, that's a good question too, because you have the little sacs, just like our salivary glands are just up above the eyes. I don't think they concentrate a lot of radioactive iodine. I, it probably could cause dry eyes, but usually does not cause dry eyes. I, what I would say is there's a syndrome called Sjogren's. I don't know if you guys have heard of Sjogren's. It's where you're, they, it's an autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, but what they attack is your saliva glands and also your glands that make tears. So this, your immune system attacks them. 
One thing we do believe is if somebody's at risk for that, we don't have a way to tell very well. If you give them radioactive iodine, it could make it worse. So those types of people could, if they were susceptible to get Sjogren's, could get dry eyes, definitely get dry mouth, even with lower doses. So it is a, it is a bit of a concern. So this is kind of how, and the bottom, what I want to point out is that bottom line, that's the thyroglobulin. They brought it in. So even if you're kind of more of an intermediate risk patient, but you have a low thyroglobulin, it maybe would push you to saying either low dose or don't use radioactive iodine. I still would say if you're a high risk patient and you have a low thyroglobulin afterwards, number one, congratulations, that's great. <laughs> but number two, we probably still would use adjuvant radioiodine therapy because we don't have, you know, there's where we do have evidence that it works and we don't have parsed evidence that if your post-op thyroglobulin is low, your, your recurrence risk is no different with or without radioactive iodine. And then this is just an example of a patient, you know, a, a, a T2 tumor with an N1A. So a medium-sized tumor with involved lymph nodes, this thing, you could put them anywhere along this spectrum. So that's kind of part of the problem too is, and I would look at that patient and most likely if their post-op thyroglobulin was low, I'd say, I don't think we need radioactive iodine. Again, patients who've seen me know that the other thing I like to say is, I think about thyroid cancer all day long. And if you took 10 people like me around the country, you know, like, and let's say for this patient, I would say eight of us would say, you don't need radioactive iodine. Two would say, man, maybe we should use radioactive iodine. So there's still a little bit of debate in the field, but we're moving more and more towards being uh, using less and using lower amounts. And again, the low post-op TG and the higher post-op TG. And then uh, before, I guess we have a question. Before I say that, I'll say antibodies. And we can, in the questions, we can talk about antibodies. But antibodies is really a tricky issue. Um, antibodies is more of a tricky issue. That's why also I get that pre-op thyroglobulin, because if those antibodies are strongly positive, and we were thinking of on the fence of whether we take out half of the whole thyroid, we might lean a little more toward the whole thyroid, because if you leave half a thyroid in, those antibodies are going nowhere. They're staying there. And it is shown out of a number of studies that when you remove the thyroid plus minus radioactive iodine, people have antibodies, a lot of them, the antibodies over a number of years, but will come down. So it's a, it helps you in your thought process on, oh, if we're on the fence, maybe that'll push us this way on the fence. What was the question? If I have autoimmune disease, does that affect whether to do REI or not if you're at intermediate risk? Good question. Again, I, I, I would say if a patient has Sjogren's, as an autoimmune disease, I would maybe take that into account. That would push me again, away from radioactive iodine. Now, if I thought the radioactive iodine was really gonna help, I would use it anyway, because we don't have good data. But if I'm kind of on the fence about whether you're using it or not, that would. If they have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, I, I don't know of evidence that would say we you know, should hold off on that, especially in someone where I think it's gonna be a benefit. Jumping back to the xylomelts, what are those side effects? One of the side effects is xylomelts. The most common, what it is, is it's a, a drug called sorbitol. So it's a non-absorbable sugar. Um, that's what kind of makes them sweet as well. And so it runs through your system. And so if you have this kind of sugar, what it does is it pulls water out of your gut and people can get uh, bloating, diarrhea, things like that uh, with, with xylomelts, with any, of the, with any of the products that use sorbitol. One last question. Yeah. Um, classic popular thyroid cancer. Uh, they were having troubles with the risk table, 2.1 centimeter tumor, good margins, six out of 14 lymph node involvement with extra ex nodal e &E. extension, e &E. Yeah, mm -hmm. 0.5 centimeter is the largest. Mm -hmm. And they were wondering if they, that would be intermediate. Oh, would that be intermediate risk? Uh, yeah, it would be what I would call the upper end of intermediate risk. I thought the question would be is like, what should we do next? I, like, I can't do that here. Can't do that here. But yes, it would, that would be, I think most of us would agree in the middle or higher part of that, that, well, I think I have it on my next slide. So in the middle or higher part of that, because you see where extra nodal extension is in there. Um, it, the extra nodal extension is a little tricky because if you have like one lymph node with a tiny bit, mm, you know, if you have a whole bunch of lymph nodes that have it, and especially if they're big, then you're in the higher risk group. But that, that would, to me, sound more like an intermediate risk patient. And I would definitely have a conversation with that patient about radioactive iodine. And then, because the other thing is, you realize here, if we're in a gray area, the big thing we need to do is explain it to our patients. And also, we should always bring them into the decision making, but even more so in these grayer areas. Say, okay, here's, and here's what eight out of 10 docs that say do this. I'm in that eight group is what I'd say to them. And then I'd have the conversation. Some patients say, you know what? 
I hear what you're saying. I'd like a little bit of radioactive iodine so I can sleep better at night, even despite that. And I say, that's when I give them the 30 millicuries, because um, hopefully you're not going to do harm with that. Um, and then others will say, I don't want radiation. I mean, I have some patients who have high risk disease and they're like, I don't want radiation. I go, okay. And we keep having the conversation. And if there are worrisome features, I keep, I just keep having the conversation with them, but this is where we definitely want to bring in patient decision-making. So this, this water thing here means crystal clear. Yes. We use radioactive iodine in the high risk group, crystal clear. No, in this low risk group, and then clear as mud kind of in the middle group. And when I do still that not routine quite a ways up and it's that narrow little group in there where we consider it, you know, in patients who are kind of that middle to higher intermediate risk group. And it depends on the post-op thyroglobulin and all those things. And so I'll come back. And this was my original thing. If you want to ask questions or talk about any of these topics, we can do that. Thank you. We actually do have more Zoom questions. What's that? We do have more Zoom questions. More Zoom questions. All right. How many people are on Zoom? Uh, 92. Yeah. Welcome, Zoom people. <laughs> uh, do you consider a thyroglobulin level between one and five as a low value or high value? <laughs> I would say that a thyroglobulin value between one and five is a thyroglobulin value between one and five. <clears throat> um, but what, what I, most of us agree, less than one is definitely low. Above 10 is definitely high. In between, it's a little more dicey. I, I'm even good with two, you know, and it depends on if you know the surgeon and some surgeons do leave a bit more normal thyroid behind. So sometimes I'll do an ultrasound. I've had a couple, actually I had one patient who had a thyroidectomy, came to see me. We got an ultrasound. They had a perfectly normal looking thyroid. They took out their thymus. Now that's rare, but <laughs> so if you do have a high thyroglobulin, you don't know the surgeon, I would do an ultrasound. And if there's a lot of thyroid tissue left behind, I wouldn't be as worried that that thyroglobulin of two or three, somebody with surgeons I know, or a good ultrasound shows there's no tissue left. I'm a little bit more worried about three and four. I would maybe, if I didn't use radio iodine, would follow them pretty closely. And if it starts going up, would consider radio iodine. And I'm going to bring in Carrie. She's going to, they're, they're going to ask their question over with your voice. Oh, there yes, go. there. Oh, yes, Carrie. Can you hear me? Yes, um, I have a, a support group member in my um, support group who has been recently diagnosed, is scheduled for radioactive iodine, has a doctor who is not very well versed in thyroid cancer. Um, how would she have access to some of the guidelines that you're showing that aren't public, like aren't published, you know, officially? in the 2024 guidance. Cause my concern is if she got restaged, she probably wouldn't need radioactive iodine and she's literally scheduled for it like in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, the first thing I would say is to go, you can go to thyroid.org. That's the American thyroid association website, or you just type Google American thyroid association and they okay. do these guidelines. You can pull them up. You don't have to have a special firewall or anything. They're there. And they can look at the guidelines because even the 2015 guidelines, um, this is what I was mostly talking about because I don't know exactly what the 2024 are going to say. Fortunately, I'm not on that committee, so I'm happy about that. Um, but anyway, uh, th I, I think this judicious use, it's in the 20, 2015 guidelines. So I think oh, they can okay. pull those up. Now, I must admit, you got to be careful because some doctors are like, I don't like my patient pulling up things and showing it to me and saying, do this. But you know, a good doctor should have a conversation with that patient and be able to, and, and again, at the end of the day, if that patient looks at this stuff and talks to others and says, you know, this is gray area and I, I want to hold off on radio iodine for now, two things. doesn't mean they can never have it. You just hold off for now and say, I'm deferring. I don't want to use it right now. And it's ultimately up to the patient. That doctor, it's not, the doctor isn't the one who's saying you have to have radioactive iodine. And if they're forcing it, I would try to find another doctor. Okay. So maybe I was a little confused in some of the slides that you had up. I thought those were um, updates from the 2015. No, well, some of the papers, because this is where I'm focusing in on that intermediate. Yeah. And those papers are all available as well. Um, but, but since the 2015 guidelines, that intermediate risk group, there still is a bunch of debate. I'm just kind of giving you my take on yeah. the data and my thoughts on when to use it, when not to use it. I'm not as aggressive as maybe some others are. Um, but I, I would say that most of us at the big centers who are doing a lot of this have backed off on how much we're using and the activity. So that is all available data. 
I don't, I, those... I'm not privy to the 2024 guidelines. <laughs> okay. So you're saying the papers, what you're showing was basically based on that newer research and yes. those would all be available on uh, thyroid dot uh, org. Just the guidelines are available okay. on thyroid dot org. The other ones are available, you know, and a lot of them, a lot of these papers are uh, open for public. You don't have to have a firewall or a subscription, but some yeah. do. It just depends on the journal. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I had a total thyroidectomy, papillary thyroid cancer, BRAF positive, given over 200 millicuries of radioiodine post-surgery. One year later, TG growing, all scan negative, but RAI is no longer effective. What is the next course of treatment if surgery and RAA are not an option? Yep. No, that's a good question. I'm sorry you're dealing with that. Some patients will have that where you have radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer that is growing. And especially in some people, it's causing symptoms. Um, that, that's a whole nother talk. And I'm sure there are some other talks here on that. And that's the last thing I have, last bullet I have here is radioiodine refractory. Just to give you a general feeling of what I do is I ask the question, can we watch this? Because in some people, it doesn't grow very fast and they're asymptomatic and you could, you could defer that treatment for a number of years. Um, and, and still, I think you're doing that patient okay. Then I ask the question is if you have like one big tumor growing, can we do directed therapy, surgery, radiation, ablation techniques that we do in interventional radiology? Then I say systemic therapy and the most common drug that we use in patients who have this refractory disease is one called lenvatinib. Um, there's a number of drugs we use, but that's the most common one we use. And there's newer data, which I'll talk in the anaplastic section on, on using combination therapies and things like that. But that's where, so the biggest thing I would say is if the person is not at some place where they have a team of people that take care of this, I, it, I would try to at least go someplace that does have a team where you can get an opinion on, on what are the best things to do. And they can help guide whether it's a medical oncologist or endocrinologist or surgeon. Hi, Dr. Hagen. Um, I had a Herthel cell tumor removed and I still have the other, I had a lobectomy and we're just following right now. I'm curious what you think a good range for thyloglobulin is in that scenario. And yep. I don't have any antibodies. So no, it's a, that's a very good question. And you, here's where you're going to get a lot of, there's some people that say, don't even do a thyroglobulin because it's going to be usually with a half a thyroid. And if your TSH is normal or slightly suppressed is what we kind of do with most people in that low risk group. I hope yours didn't have vascular invasion. I was less than four. Less than four. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. Less than four is the cutoff. I always, I always hate those binary things. Cause what if it's three versus five? Yeah, he, my, endo, my endocrinologist <laughs> is looking into how many exactly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but it is, that is considered lower risk. I, I must admit my, my, my worry meter is a little higher with vascular invasion, but there is data that fewer than four vessels kind of behave more like a low risk tumor. Okay. Um, and it was 4.2 centimeters. Oh, so. just above four centimeters. Yeah, so. You're just messing everything up, aren't you? I'm in the gray area. Um, <laughs> so. Messing all our simple guidelines up. Yep. <laughs> um, patients, that's right. Patients are all unique. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so in my mind, what I tend to do is actually I get a pre-op um, and, but with a post-op with a half of a normal thyroid with somebody on thyroid hormone can be as low as three or four, can be as high as 20. Okay. It's kind of the range I'm looking at. And what I tend to do is get it. And let's say yours is 15. Mm -hmm. Then if the next time I see you, it's 300, I'm going to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, if it's 17, I'm going to say it's probably just normal variation okay. that we see. Large differences. I'm looking for large differences. And that's why some people don't like using it because it's pretty crude, you know, when you have a half a thyroid in, but I still, I still find some utility in it. Um, I was just curious what, like when you refer to post-op thyroglobulin, like how long post-op that is, if it's like a month, a couple months. Yeah. Um, so thyroglobulin has a half-life in the blood of about three days. The other thing is when the surgeon takes out your thyroid and it's not the surgeon's fault, but it's at the act of taking out your thyroid makes your thyroglobulin go up. Um, so you don't want to do it soon after the earliest I've seen people do it is about three weeks. We tend to do it six weeks. Um, anything longer than that's fine too, you know, but obviously if you go too long, then you're not getting an idea of, if, is it up and are you worried, but I probably would do a minimum of three weeks and we do six. Okay. Thank you. Also six weeks, I think is good because then when you put somebody on thyroid hormone, you want to repeat the TSH on thyroid hormone in six weeks. So it's kind of a good time to get both. Do a few more. If I have a family member or family history of other cancers, lung and breast in particular, would that influence the risk of other cancers with RAI? 
Oh, good question. Um, so two things out of that, I thought I was going in a different direction. First thing is, is if I see a patient who now has thyroid cancer, who had breast and lung cancer, two things. Um, one is I'm worried that there's something going on, especially with what are called the tumor suppressor genes, the breaks of the system. And so I usually have them see um, our, our people in the cancer center who do genetic counseling. Um, and then we'll kind of look and see, are there tests that they should have of their blood to say, do they carry something? Because it'll help us with screening for other cancers and also help them inform their family members. Um, they can get checked and things like that. If the person does have some sort of a germline, meaning in the blood, genetic mutation. The second thing about radioactive iodine, I have had a couple of patients who have had multiple other cancers. Um, and I have used that again on my fence to push me a little more towards maybe we won't use radioactive iodine. I don't have specific evidence, but if radioactive iodine can cause cancers and somebody has a genetic susceptibility to multiple cancers, it kind of makes sense to me biologically. So I tend to be a little more cautious. If they have super high risk disease, I still use it, you know. If you're high risk, over 55, tumor was greater than four centimeters, distant metastasis in both lungs, good response to REI, but the TG is going up, doubling within six months. No idea of uptake on scans, however, wait. Uh, TG goes down, would you give REI again? Oops, missed the last part. So T TG's going up, good, good response to radioactive iodine probably means they took it up and the thyroglobulin dropped or the tumors, if you're following them, shrank. So that's good response. But then I heard TG going up and then at the end, I heard TG going down. Yeah, I don't have a add on to that. So. Oh, okay, okay. If TG, let's use the TG going up. <laughs> if TG is going up, I definitely would do a diagnostic scan. And if the diagnostic scan is positive, I use more radioactive iodine. Obviously in the lungs, you want to use CT scan as well. And you can do that without contrast. So it doesn't get in the way of your radioactive iodine. Are those nodules growing? You know, so I, th there's some different things I'd want to kind of know, but I would definitely, if it's TG is going up, they had a previous dose, you can give more. I would, um, I would get a low dose test to see, do they still concentrate radioactive iodine? Is there a sweet spot for risk and reward in terms of timing REI treatment? Huh? Earlier, more adjuvant versus later to treat detectable tumors with lower versus higher doses. Yeah, you know, if you wait and people do have like, let's say metastatic disease, there is some evidence that those tumors over time probably will become radioiodine refractory. So you do want to use it up front, especially in somebody with metastatic disease. I don't think you want to hold it in your back pocket and wait because things can change. Um, so I tend to use that up front more as an adjuvant. And also in somebody with known metastatic disease that concentrates it, I do use multiple doses and I'll separate them. Usually the shortest interval, I'll go is six months. Usually it's a year later. In kids, I wait two, a good two years just because, again, more of the radiation effects. Um, but I would use it more upfront in a higher risk patient, especially with metastatic disease. Wouldn't wait. And this will be the last question for the session. Uh, patient is PT3B with extrathyroidal extension invading only the strap muscles. Is that considered a higher end intermediate risk? <laughs> yeah, because that, that's where we do this thing. In my book, yes. I think in some people who maybe do more general endocrinology and a little bit of this, they'd put it way on their high risk group. I would put this in the intermediate, but to high risk because it's gross extrathyroidal extension, sounds like. Um, and it's um, into strap muscles, which going forward into the muscles is not, at least as far as recurrence and problems that people get into, is not as worrisome. It still is worrisome and you want to take care of it as going backwards. Because going backwards around the blood vessels into the trachea, into the esophagus is, is a much more serious disease and it's harder to control that. So we treat that more aggressively. Okay, and with that, I thank everybody for attending and I thank you for your time, Dr. Howden. Thank you. I appreciate it.